Hello, everyone. Welcome to Tuesday Conversation with Friends. And today I have Jeremy Siskind with me. And initially, I encountered his work because I was looking for something to work on with my students. And then I just fell in love with some of his compositions. And I thought it'd be so cool to get to know who you are. So would you please introduce yourself, and so we can get to know where you come from and what you're doing, and maybe a little bit of information on your creative process. Sure. Yeah. So my name is Jeremy Siskin.、Um, I live in Long Beach, California. I'm a professor of piano at Fullerton College.、Um, besides that, I'm a professional jazz pianist. I perform and record、um, with a variety of different projects. I lead a chamber jazz trio called the Housewarming Project,、um, mm. which、uh, specializes in in-home concerts. And I'm really proud to share we recently got a thirty thousand dollar grant from Chamber Music America to write some new music. Um, I also write and publish a lot of books,、um, both instructional books and、uh, repertoire books for、mm-hmm. young pianists.、Uh, with、mm-hmm. the、uh, the mission behind my books, I would say, is to give them a version of jazz that really relates to jazz history.、Um, mm. There's a lot of good,、uh, interesting, fun jazz pieces out there, but、right. as somebody who、uh, you know has become a professional jazz musician and really values that whole tradition. It's really crucial to the jazz tradition that is connected to the history of the music. So, in everything that I write and publish, I try to relate it to something in the recorded history or in the、um, you know the storytelling history of jazz music, so that it hopefully isn't <clears throat> a stopping point for the student, but it's an entryway for them to、right. get into jazz and explore it further and have an even more rewarding experience getting to know the music. Right, because I know the material I'm using from you with one of my students, it definitely touches upon a lot of this history and where it comes from, and、uh, and stylistically the rhythm, the chords, and why are they, how are they structured, and、uh, and both myself and the student have a great time with it because it's not just、uh, us sitting here. Typing out the notes, there is a story in、mm. everything we're doing, and I love that about. What I were experiencing through your books, and I know we have mentioned、uh, we, when we were talking just a few minutes ago before we started recording, you were talking about、um, the four things, the four elements、um, that you, you you presented in a conference about how how pe- how a person needs to know in order to really be a good expressive jazz musician. Would you please share that? Yeah, absolutely. So、um, this is something I've been developing because it's really hard to teach jazz, and it's really hard, in particular,、yes. to teach imp- improvisation,、mm-hmm. because a lot of technique it's somewhat of a straight line. You learn how to play a five finger pattern. You learn how to play staccato, legato, a two note slur.、Um, you learn how to cross over and under. There's kind of a、mm-hmm. we could disagree about exactly the process, but there's a step by step. Process for、uh, for things to go, and、um, various publishing companies and individuals can write method books、um, that kind of draw that process. With jazz, it's just not quite the same because、mm-hmm. every student enters with a completely different set of skills. Right. And,、um, so one of the things that I've done for myself and for my students that helps give us a frame for how I'm molding、um, a curriculum for each student. Mm-hmm. Is we talked about these four skill sets. So the first is technique or muscle memory, and that's how well do you know your instrument. If I ask you to improvise on an E flat major scale, are、mm-hmm. you going to be able to do that without playing an A natural or without having、right. your fingers slip、mm-hmm. to a different note?、Um, are you going to have a lot of freedom? Or are you going to have to kind of stay right within,、uh, you know, the next note of the scale?、Mm-hmm. Um, the second one is your brain and your theory knowledge.、Mm-hmm. Um, Jazz musicians don't love being overly intellectual, but we do know a lot of scales because we、right. love all these different colors, and、mm-hmm. we need to be able to find chords. When we see a chord symbol, we need to know the notes、mm-hmm. of the chord immediately. For pianists, we need to not only know the notes of the chords, we need to find an interesting voicing、right. um, for those chords. Right, voicing、mm-hmm. meaning that we stack the notes、right. in a different、right. way. Right, right, right.、Um, mm-hmm. We need to be able to find non-chord tones. How do we、mm-hmm. find a note that's just a half step away from one of the chord tones? So there's、mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff that you need to really know、um, intellectually. Right.、Um, thirdly, there's the ear,、um, mm-hmm. and the ear. Frankly, you know, we can know all of this theory, but it's not theory that makes a great melody. 
a great melody comes from hearing it in your inner ear and then bringing it out through your voice or through your mm -hmm. instrument. So that's really crucial. And I find that that's probably the best indicator as to whether somebody's going to be really successful as an improviser is whether they have a good ear. Right. Um, and of course, there's things we can do to train the ear. It's not just that you're born with it. Um, some people do come in with a stronger skill set mm -hmm. there, but uh, it's definitely worth somebody's time to train their ear. Mm. And then lastly, I call the last category the heart, um, but that's a little bit of a cheesy way of saying it, <laughs> right? There's this last category uh, where some people have a musical charisma. They have a voice on their instrument, a certain sound that they're able to get. Maybe it's a patience that they have improvising. Maybe it's their time of feel. Maybe they uh, lay back really far behind the beat and it feels really good. Mm -hmm. um, I have a colleague who refers to this as the Bob Dylan effect, right? You think about Bob Dylan, and God bless him, love him or hate him, um, he's not the greatest technical singer in the world, right? Who cares, <laughs> um, though? Nobody cares if he's the greatest technical singer. Because there's something about him. It's hard to put your finger on, right? Right. Um, but there's some kind of charisma to how he delivers a lyric. There's something That's compelling. Right. Mm -hmm. And great, any great creative artist, performer, whether it's jazz, classical, folk, whatever, mm -hmm. um, needs that fourth thing as well. Um, right. And that's pretty hard to train. And in fact, Very. when I give these four things, um, I give them in this order for a couple of reasons. First of all, the first one I think is the easiest to train and focus on, right? Muscle mm -hmm. memory, we can play our scales all day. We can track our progress easily. Mm -hmm. The brain, okay, we can, I can teach you new scales. I can quiz mm -hmm. you on theory. Mm -hmm. The ear is a little bit harder to, you know, precisely know exactly how you're doing. And this heart thing, I don't know how I would give a test for that in class, right? That would be near impossible to quantify that. Right. But, but I the think the other it's... thing about... Mm -hmm. oh, go ahead, um, please. Go ahead, please. I'll, I'll say one more thing here and then, uh, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you ask another question. No, we... the, the other thing about this order is that I feel that when, you, when music's working the best, mm -hmm. it starts with the heart. Mm -hmm. It starts with a feeling or mm -hmm. something you want to express. Mm -hmm. You hear it in your inner ear as a melody or a chord progression or whatever that might be. Then you need to know enough in your brain to actually figure out what scale, which, what chords. Mm -hmm. And then it comes out through the muscle memory of the technique. Mm -hmm. And you can see that how frustrating it would be to learn because imagine you're doing great on those first three steps but you don't have the technique to express it well. Right. In rhythm with good articulation, nobody's ever going to know, right? <laughs> that, you, that you thought of, you heard this, you experienced mm -hmm. this beautiful thing. Um, and a lot, a lot of times those people prefer to compose rather than to improvise because right. they have all of this beautiful music inside of them, but not necessarily the facility to get right. it out. Right. Um, but in jazz, we constantly have to be uh, going back and forth between these four categories and saying, okay, well, you're hearing this, but you can't play it, or you're playing this, but are you really hearing it? And is it really saying anything? And here's another scale you could use that might make that more colorful. So it's this wild balancing act. And, um, you know, my publishing company, Hal Leonard, would love nothing better than for me to write a jazz method that took you from, you know, very basic to um, very complex, but it just doesn't work like that. There's not a straight line. It's constantly going back and forth and training these different skills. I think Sorry, that was a very long answer to your very No, no, question. no. I love it. That's the reason why I asked the question, because I don't believe um, answers for those type of things should be short, because it's a complex yeah. process. And if it is short, then there's something either truncated or a disconnection. And it goes back to the heart, right? There's a disconnection. And, um, and I, I remember recently I was teaching a student one of Chopin's preludes, and she just, um, the more she practiced, the worse she got. <laughs> and she, I've, I've had that experience. Right. Yeah. And, um, and she has always been a very intuitive learner because she's been with me since she was little. So I know that I know the student as a person, not just as a student. And so, so we made, I made a choice. I said, well, now it's, we're doing lessons on Zoom. One of the greatest possibility we can do is a YouTube. And so I picked a interpretation, a particular performance of that prelude that I don't think everybody will agree with the interpretation, the choices, mm -hmm. but it was one of the very emotional and very heart-oriented performance. And uh, we listened through it, and I said to her afterwards, I said, listen, I know you know how this piece sounds like. We're not listening to figure out how this piece sounds like, but I need you to experience the piece. I need mm -hmm. you to go back 
to why you chose to play this piece because you picked it because you fell in love with the sound. But now we have moved away from that experience of loving, of that being in love with why you want to do this. So it was like magic. Afterwards,、mm. immediately the student changed, and changed from being a student who is trying so hard to type the notes out to trusting her instincts. And I think that's something that you're talking about: is that heart, whether it's classical, whether it's jazz, whether it's vocal, and、um, and and I think that is a very difficult thing to help the students to connect with. But why make music if you don't have it? Of course. Well, I have this theory about teaching, and,、mm-hmm. and tell me if it resonates with you or not.、Sure. But、mm-hmm. um, I think you know. Of course, as teachers, we have to do all that grunt work of、mm-hmm. telling them、right. when they're playing a wrong note, correcting their fingering. <laughs> But I think truly great teaching is actually when we can connect two of these categories. Right.、So、when we can connect something that they're doing.、Um, Technically, with a sound that they want to make, or something that they're doing technically、right. with the emotion that they're going for, or、mm-hmm. what they're hearing to what you want them to feel,、mm-hmm. um, and I think that that's where, as teachers, we can do something. You know, of course, as time goes on,、uh, technology is taking so taking away some of the things that we d- could do as teachers, right?、Um, you know, now they can watch a YouTube t- tutorial on something, or they can、uh, use one of these apps to see if they're sight reading well, and all this、right. is. Good, but、mm-hmm. I think that's the thing that they're never going to quite be able to replace in teachers is the ability to make connections between these、yes. different skills that we need as musicians. Exactly, they have the tools, but they need that person to make that connection. And、um, I, I, I would like to ask you how you started because obvious,、uh, I, from what I watch on YouTube, the way you play, and also、mm-hmm. the,、uh, the 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 set of pieces you put together for impressions based on WC, you're obviously classically trained. But at some point,、um, whether it's conscious or not conscious, you made the decision to 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 move a little differently than the rest of your your peers. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm actually I'm kind of honored and tickled that you say that I'm obviously classically classically trained because for a lot of my career that wasn't so obvious.、Um, and it's something that、um, you know my weak of、uh, those four aspects. I know that my weak part is my muscle memory and my technique,、um, and I've, I've worked very hard to try to、uh, to try to raise the level、um, of that aspect. But so I grew up in the Yamaha music education system.、Um, okay. I don't know how much you or the viewers、uh, know about Yamaha, but Um, I think it's really fantastic. It's a very well-rounded musical education. It's not just you know put the piece in front of you and play the piece. We started.、Um, they, they'll start students as young as three and a half. I think I was four. When, I was four、uh, when I did Yamaha. Yay! <laughs> I was. They always made me knew, the middle C. They with all the lines on the floor for the staff, and I was middle C. You were all in middle C. I love it. I knew we were kindred spirits. Right.、Um, yeah. So they they always do you know playing with percussion instruments, singing solfege from a very young age. Yes.、Uh, playing keyboard ensembles, not just solo work.、Um, and so I had this kind of very. A well-rounded musical training, and、mm-hmm. didn't know a time when improvising or composing wasn't a part of my musical menu of things that I might do. I think I wrote my first piece, which was called "Finding Bugs," at age five or six,、um, and、uh, composing was just always something that I did, and、uh, I was always encouraged to explore.、Um, and I was the kind of student who would. Think that I knew mo- more than the composers I was playing. I understand. <laughs> I would, yes, I would、uh, make a variation on the piece, or I would change a few notes, or I would go for an alternate chord.、Um, <laughs> and to my credit, I had this wonderful teacher named Suzanne Wong,、um, and、uh, she saw that I a wasn't the perfect classical pianist, and probably wasn't going to be a concert pianist anytime soon. But b that I actually had something different to offer, and.、Um, I, I was so fortunate that she had a former student、uh, named Linda Martinez, who was a great jazz pianist and composer. And、uh, sh- so my my teacher Suzanne very generously said, I think when I was twelve or thirteen, you know, I love teaching you, but I'm gonna give you over to this other teacher because I think、wow. that I think that's where、mm. you are going to fit more.、Um, I love that. And, yeah, I and love I, that. I we can all be as. Generous as teachers,、yes. you know. Yes, that's so important.、Um, yeah, and it. She was absolutely right. It was such a good fit for me、um, mm-hmm. because I just always wanted to be creative. I always wanted to change the notes. I always wanted to express myself, and that's 
essentially what a jazz musician does, right? right. A jazz musician right. will never play the same thing twice. Um, and so it was, it was this validation <laughs> of everything that was already going on in my mind. Right. <laughs> um, right. And so I, I really felt like I found a home and Linda was a really fantastic teacher. Um, mm -hmm. And we, we formed a really nice uh, bond. And I, I, I had a, um, a great high school program and started playing jazz with friends. And this is one of the things that um, maybe might be interesting about jazz mu music is you really need to be doing it with other people. Uh, whereas you can become a great classical pianist locked in a room for eight hours a day by yourself. It doesn't really work with jazz. It's a social music mm -hmm. and it's so much about learning from one another, learning how to play in a group and having that experience. And it just breaks my heart in this pandemic, of course, that for a lot of musicians, you know, imagine your bass player out there who his role is walking a bass line. It's not that much fun. It's not that interesting to I do know. by yourself. Right. Um, and uh, so we're doing, we're all doing the best we can, of course, but right, um, right. I was lucky to have really good colleagues. Um, you know, it's so and, true. Yeah, it's, it's tough. And of course, chamber music is important in classical music, but it's not quite as crucial to a pianist as, uh, you know, as it is to play in a group in jazz. And then I, I spent a lot of the next eight years plus still am um, trying to recover my technique. <laughs> I, I, was, I understand. Yes. yes I was the yes, typical yes. jazz pianist with a great ear and lots of creativity and just terrible technique. Um, so I. You were, um, you were going to get it out any way you could and in real time, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I think totally. one of the things about pianists and the piano study is you, you see sometimes some piano students and even professional pianists, their rhythm is really strange and mm. because they don't play with others. Right. Yeah, they don't play with others. And I, I personally, I, I love piano forehand literature and I've done a lot of performances with piano forehand literature and being a singer, of course, we're always working with other pianists. and. Um, it is a very different experience and goes back to the Yamaha days, right? We start with mm -hmm. solfege and we, with all those little rhythm instruments and with mm -hmm. playing with a class, you from from very begin from the very beginning, I think that's something that's sometimes missing in piano training is that ensemble experience, yeah. that collaborative experience where everybody is a part of something. And um, of course, I know in our other conversation, you were t mentioning the way you were being rebellious as a, <laughs> as a student was uh, play the first half of the piece and then the second half, well, <laughs> it was, could be anything. And I mm -hmm. think um, for, for musical kids, our rebellion is a little bit, it, it's just not the same kind of excitement, but it's to us, it's very exciting. I remember I was around the same time I decided I didn't want to take piano lessons for classical piano anymore. I wanted to do jazz. My mom thought it would be very ladylike of me to learn how to play the harp. Ooh. <laughs> So she gave me the money and told me to walk down the street to go to the same music store where I was taking the jazz lessons from to sign up for harp lessons. Mm -hmm. And I looked around and I said, um, I think it'll be a lot more fun to play the drums. <laughs> 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 so I signed up for drum lessons and my mom kept asking me, don't you have recitals? Oh, no, 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 not for harps. <laughs> you wow, know? so you took, you took drum lessons. Yeah, when I was around the same time was taking, taking the jazz I'm piano. And Let's see. No, yeah, it's fun, but I suck. So, you know, yeah. but it, it, it enriched my experience as a musician. You know, it changed the way I listen to music as a singer, the way I work with um, the rest of the music. And so I think that's the part that I, I wish all the students have that experience to experience that ensemble studying, ensemble learning, not just kind of on their own, you know, and uh, it, it's, it's something, um, I think there's something about the sharing of the experience sometimes is really missed. And I do have a, a question about something that's unrelated, but I know you okay. mentioned in the beginning, and I also saw it on your bio, about the in-home concerts, that mm -hmm. whole concept and how you developed it. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm always thrilled to talk about in-home concerts. Of course, yes. I haven't done any lately, but <laughs> I look forward to getting back to it. Um, so the whole idea of doing in-home concerts um, it stemmed from a few places, but I guess the core question for me is as a musician, oftentimes we can feel very selfish. Mm -hmm. and let me tell right. you what I mean by that is that um, if I want somebody to hear my music, I have to send out a lot of emails, um, you know, badgering people. And then I have to post on Facebook, listen to my right. new piece. And then I have to very ego. Schedule, schedule, mm -hmm. And then I have to schedule a performance and kind of beg my friends to come. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, you know, as your career gets better and better, hopefully there's more people who are just naturally interested. But mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's an uphill battle. Um, you know, there's not a ton of people out there who want to go to a piano concert. Um, and, but I feel like the reason that I got into music mm -hmm. is to give. To be right. unselfish. Right? I agree. Because right. I, I think of the musical artists who I listen to mm -hmm. um, and love their music, and they've added so much to my life. <laughs> I mean, a, a world without, I don't know, Brad Meldow or Fred Hirsch or Keith Jarrett, uh, just listen, or, you know, older pianists like Hank Jones or Thelonious Monk or Bill Evans, mm -hmm. uh, my life would be so much less for not having them. And I want to be that for, for people. So I want right. to give to them. Um, so this idea of in-home concerts, the beauty of it to me is that I find a host and, you know, the hosts, you, they have to have a piano. So usually there's somebody who's maybe a piano teacher or their mm -hmm. kids taking piano or they're, mm -hmm. uh, they're somehow involved with music. Usually. Right. Otherwise, I'd have trouble finding them. Um, but then they invite 20, 30, if they have a big house, maybe more than that, people from their community, mainly who aren't musicians. Right. Um, right. They're the audience friends, members. They're, right. Yeah. They're, and what a concept kids, to have actual teacher. audience members. <laughs> right. Not yeah, just so other musicians sitting in the audience. Exactly. And mm -hmm. um, I have a I have this guest book that I'll take to all of my in-home concerts and ask people, you know, leave your email if you're comfortable, but leave a comment. That's what I really want. And mm -hmm. so often we're getting this comment of, I didn't know that I needed a concert like this in my life, but actually mm -hmm. it helped me so much. Or mm -hmm. I didn't know that I liked this kind of music, but this right. was a great evening. You know, I didn't think that I'd enjoy a jazz performance, um, but it turns out maybe I like jazz. And mm -hmm. for me, that means so much. Uh, I don't want to say that it means more than the compliment of a, you know, a fellow musician, because that means a lot in a different way. But yes. that really makes it nourishes me in, with this feeling that I'm giving. So for me, it's this little kind of way of getting around this system of, as you yes. said, so often musicians listening to other musicians, mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to impress other musicians, and it becomes this echo chamber that I don't think it's good for the art form. And I don't think so. I feel great. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's a big part of my love for the in home concert. Mm, so th that's the part of reason why I wanted to ask that question, because I'm a big believer in meeting the audience where they are. And, mm. uh, and I, I really believe now my, my genre is clearly mostly classical. And, uh, but what is special about vocal music is it's it always tells a story. And uh, if I do the kind of programming that works, and uh, I can reach the audience members who don't go to the council halls. I'm sharing something that I'm passionate about in a way that is um, that is my 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 privilege to have an opportunity to share with them. And if you look at the painting behind me, that I was one it. of yeah, that's one of those situations where I created an opportunity that was a little different, a little unique. And it was actually on campus at a technical college. They don't have music classes, period. And uh, so it's interesting. And so we did a presentation with a photographer friend of mine where her photography was projected onto the large screen in the le lecture hall. And, uh, and me and another pianist and, uh, and a live artist did a painting. Mm -hmm. And he said, this is a painting of your voice. He said, love <laughs> it. Right. And he's ne now even the artist has never attended a, a combination of a new age jazz and a classical concert. And he's he's never painted anything that looked like this either. But something happened in him and it was memorialized as an experience. And yeah. uh, and the, of course, the members felt the same way. The people who are in the audience, it was a different kind of experience. And I think music needs to be alive and shared. And it's um. You know, I, I love the idea that you have for the in-home concert. I was curious on how you get around with the piano issue, but I guess you look for people who have pianos. Yeah. And it's a lot. Yeah. 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 And I mean, the other thing that's beautiful about the in-home concert, I don't know about you, but it's becoming increasingly difficult as somebody really passionate about an acoustic piano to find really good venues with acoustic oh. pianos, mm -hmm. um, especially out on the West Coast. Um, here's just a fun fact. I thought it was really interesting. Apparently mm -hmm. for quite a while, 
you know, all of the American piano makers on the East Coast, you know, Steinway, mm-hmm, right. uh, Mason and Hamlin, mm-hmm. uh, they couldn't ship over the Rockies, apparently. So there's far fewer pianos on the West Coast than there are on the East Coast. Um, I didn't know that. Wow. Well, you think about it, and you even think about it historically, you know, every social club have to had to have a piano in a certain right. era. While yes, it was yes, happening on the yes. East Coast, but the West Coast wasn't really quite flourishing by then. You're right. So, You're right. Yeah. Yes, because I used to live, my, my family lives in Los Angeles and went to USC, that's where I went to school, And but I live in Florida now, and I remember when I used to perform in Pasadena area and all that stuff, you go to a women's club and they have a really terrible piano, <laughs> uh-huh. and it's not even possible to get it tuned. It's not, it's not that it's not tuned, it's just not possible anymore, but then on the East Coast, you go to a women's club, and... Uh, yeah, Steinway. Yes, they do. They have <laughs> a Steinway yeah. Grand at Concert Grand, and uh, and it's it really is different on the East Coast that way. But I never knew why. So you learn something new every day. <laughs> that, this is what one of my Yamaha connections told me at some point. So maybe maybe I'm repeating the wrong information, but uh, it seems very plausible. Um, and there's definitely mm-hmm. a different culture on the two coasts. So it's really hard to find good venues with with beautiful. Um, acoustic pianos and so um, finding people who have a nice piano in their home um, is a nice way around that uh, because they're very I, smart about um, that that's true I'm not sure that uh, most of the music that I play uh, I don't want to use electric keyboards or because you use you lose so much of the soul of the, of the music um, so it's a, that's another reason why I kind of love these in-home concerts Ah, oh, that is so interesting. I have, I'm learning a lot from you today, not just for the for the um, for the jazz music and stuff, but it also just the whole concept of um, of what you do within home concerts and the why. Because I know as a singer, when mm-hmm. I sing with an acoustic piano, it's a very different experience than the keyboard, oh, and yeah. the overtones completely change, and even the way my voice rings off the piano changes. And, uh, and, and, but it's sometimes it's kind of hard to explain it to people because uh, it's a very subtle, to me, it's not subtle, but I know it's subtle for some people when they listen to it. Yeah. The, the way yeah that and I think, I think sometimes, uh, you know, I've had people uh, who don't really know accuse me of just like kind of being a snob or something like that. It's okay. You can be uh, a snob. We, <laughs> we'll let you be. <laughs> Thank, thank you for that. Permission. I'll, I'll let the, I'll let them know next time that you said right. that. <laughs> right, right. You know what? I'm okay. It's okay for me to be a snob, but but it it, it really is different. It really is different to me, and uh, and it's also different when you have a grand versus when you have an upright, and when you have a stick yeah. all the way up versus when you don't. To me, so <laughs> yes. And on the other hand, I understand if I were a bar owner and, you know, we had music just a few nights and I don't want to bring somebody in to tune the piano every week or every month. Sure. I understand why people don't uh, don't want to do it. But um, for the music that I want to make, for the music that I want to play, it's really essential, I feel. So I'll be a snob. <laughs> yes. And I get a sense you're very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? There is a commitment to your music that you have a relationship you have with your music making that is that's, that is fully committed and it's not really just about what um, other people expect of you but I think we've realized that from an early age you weren't gonna play what's on the page <laughs> you know? but but there's a faithfulness to the commitment itself of the music making and I think that's something that I think musicians have to always remember and the students hopefully we help the students to understand that that commitment to to what we believe is right what what we believe is communicative and expressive and um, you know um, I I just uh, I just appreciate your time so much we're having such a good time we have such a I just appreciate all the things you're sharing today but I do have to watch for the time a little bit what I like to do is before we finish can we listen to something of yours yeah um, sure I uh, here I'll share the screen mm-hmm. so um, I think I mentioned that I, I wrote a suite of perpetual motion etudes if you're wondering what that means that means that kind of between the two hands um, whatever the rhythmic unit is, whether it's 16th notes or eighth notes or triplets, um, the two, between the two hands, we're filling in every one of those rhythmic units. And so I wrote nine pieces um, that are based on this concept. And uh, some of them are very technically difficult. Some of them are, move a little bit more slowly. I tried to take every kind of different approach that I could think of 
activity. Mm. So I'll, I'll play you a little piece that's called Temple Bells. And I wrote this after a visit to Japan. Oh. And um, I got to uh, stay in this small town, not a place that you would normally go for uh, tourism. Um, but uh, I was performing there and it happened to be a center of bell making. And um, so they had this literal temple and at each stop in the temple, they had a set of bells that had been made locally. And so you could ring the bell at each uh, little, uh, I don't know, alcove of, of this that. Buddhist temple. And wow. so, uh, you know, if you're there at the right time, you're just hearing this kind of beautiful cacophony of, mm. of bells. So that inspired this piece. I don't, um, I think you'll hear both kind of an influence of maybe Eastern sounds and right. uh, hopefully you'll hear the ringing of, of bells. And, well, and each of these pieces, um, I both uh, have a written out portion and then a section for improvising. Um, and I try to blend the two so that maybe you can't necessarily tell which is which. So um, maybe you'll, you'll see uh, whether you can tell where I'm playing written out music and where it's improvised. So here we go. Give me just a second to share my screen. Take your time. Right. And make sure you share the sound as well. Yeah. Yes. Uh...
That was beautiful. Well, thank you. That made my day. Oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, that was so beautiful. And uh, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And uh, this is the reason why we make music is to share. And uh, that was just so beautiful. And uh, wow. Sorry, I think I have more music coming through from YouTube. <laughs> um, uh, that's okay. It's I, not I, showing I, up, so it's yeah. all right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm so glad you liked it. It's one of my favorites. And so just to do a shameless plug, um, that, that piece is available um, on my website and on Amazon. And you can play it either. Uh, I've arranged each of these perpetual motion etudes so that they can be played mm -hmm. just with the written out portion. So if you're scared of improvising, you don't want to do that. You can just play a kind of miniature, probably three-ish minute version of that piece. Okay. Um, or it, it also includes the optional improvisation instruction. So um, there's kind of like an off-ramp that you can take in the piece to go and improvise, or you can just play it through. And so the nine etudes, they can be played as a set of miniatures that would last about 20 minutes, mm. or um, you can watch the whole series on my YouTube channel, uh, which is just Jeremy Siskind, and it takes about probably an hour uh, with the improvising. I think so, I want to work on that piece myself. I don't know if I'm brave enough to improvise, but I love to play at least the written portion. I think it'll be, I think there's something about listening and then experiencing the music as a player. That's, that's, that's just a very visceral, a very immersive experience for me. So I think that'd be really fun for me to do that. I think I'll do uh, that. Nothing, nothing would make me happier. And of course, <laughs> I'd be happiest if you did the improvisation. Okay, I'll give that a try. <laughs> it's a little bit scary for me, but it'll be interesting to try. Yeah, but this is, sounds so, it's, um, I, I, I just, I love the collaborative part of being a musician and being in the community. As hard as COVID has been, I feel like mm -hmm. it's really opened the world up in a lot of ways because we, we tend to stay in our own corners. We, mm -hmm. we, we play with our friends, we play with our friends who we can get together with. And, but there is a whole new world of music out there and musicians out there that um, I had an interesting conversation with a friend last night and uh, he's, uh, he's, 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 he loves this collection of, um, of, uh, of uh, variations Glenn Gould did and they had all the outtakes. And I was said, you know, Glenn Gould was an original COVID musician. He decided he didn't want to do live anymore. He was going to just record it. <laughs> and and yeah, and he was one of the greatest that ever will live, not just ever lived, but ever will live. And so I think it's one of those things that um, we're alive and we're capable of creating new experiences. And uh, I always feel with those chats, with those conversations I would have with people, I don't want them to end because it's just so wonderful. <laughs> but we do have to end. And uh, But I'm just so glad you joined me and you shared your music and not just your music, but your heart and soul of why you do what you do with us. And just thank you so much. And well, thanks um, for having me. It was yeah. a and what, people can do this again. And uh, that'll be really fun. And Let's be friends. Uh, that's right. And when I come to see my parents, you're, you're not that far because they're in L.A., right? And so thank you so much. And for now, we're going to say goodbye and uh, until the next time. So thank you, Jeremy. And it's been a pleasure. Pleasure was mine. Thanks so much. Buy a little cottage and invite some friends to attend a housewarming. Sunday night You said you weren't sure You said you aren't the type To get caught in the hype And run off without warning I said don't fret We'll be real mature We'll buy a little tea kettle And a toaster too And we'll host a housewarming for the wind and a roof for the rain we'll make friends with the neighbors down the road we'll keep one light shining through our front window pane so we can always find our way
Monday morning, you were nowhere to be found. I knew you had flown when I woke up alone, and the clouds outside were storming. But you'll be back once you find some solid ground. You'll see a big fireplace by a little green. Yes, a big fireplace by a little green couch. We'll have a big old fire in that new little house. It'll be a house warming. It'll be a.